Hey there, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. <sighs> I'm gonna get choked up because I'm thinking this is the most important vlog I've ever shot. I've been doing them for five years, every Wednesday. I used to be able to say without fail, but in 2019 I, I didn't release vlogs on two Wednesdays. But anyway, a uh, while back I shot a vlog that raised a bunch of money for Charity Water and it um, is still the gift that keeps on giving because I invited people to sign up to be spring members, which means an annual, don uh, a monthly donation to the spring. Um, and there are tens of thousands of people whose lives will be changed forever, um, mostly in Africa, but not exclusively in Africa through that vlog I shot. This vlog is going to do more good by a lot, <laughs> like by a lot. And I can't wait to tell you the story that explains why you be the judge for yourself. Okay. I have to preface this just for a second, just for context, just to set the container of what I'm about to say. It's, it's so exciting. There are no words. Okay. If you watched last week's vlog, I said in it somewhere that over the Thanksgiving holiday, this last Thanksgiving holiday, just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, whatever, um, I had a series of spiritual experiences that were so powerful that I've never experienced anything like it in my life. And um, as part of those experiences, and I didn't describe them in a lot of detail, um, you know, they were super personal and most of that kind of stuff for me happens without language and it's kind of hard to describe anyway but um one of the pieces of of that was the feeling i had that the impact that bright line eating is going to have um is bigger than even i've been imagining in my wildest dreams now that's kind of crazy because um i have wild dreams <laughs> and um, i've been thinking that this has the potential to be pretty big uh, but I hadn't been thinking of it in a particular way. <sighs> I had been thinking early on, and if you've been watching for a long, 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 long time, you may have even heard me say this. I had a goal when I started out. When I started out, I had no intention of creating a course like the Brightline Eating Bootcamp. I had no intention of starting a business or ever having an employee. Uh, I never intended most of what's happened out of Brightline Eating um, because the, the beginning of all this was a meditation session that I did January 26th of 2014, which is almost six years ago now, where in that morning meditation, I felt a booming mandate that came out of nowhere that said, write a book called Bright Line Eating. I'd never heard the words Bright Line Eating before, but that's what it said. Write a book called Bright Line Eating. And I set about trying to write a book proposal. At the time, I was a tenured community college professor at Monroe Community College, teaching the psychology of eating. Um, I was teaching positive psychology. I was teaching Psych 101. I was teaching developmental psychology, blah, blah, blah and minding my own business. And oh, by the way, in my spare time, mother of three kids, spare time, I was spending about 30 hours a week helping people to lose weight and recover from food addiction for fun and for free in a 12-step program on my, in my spare time. And those two, my academic world and my, um, what do you call it? Um, avocation, my personal world, just myself being a recovering food addict, those two met in what I thought would be a book called Bright Line Eating. And of course it is a book now and it was a New York Times bestseller like I envisioned in that morning meditation that that could happen. Um, but as I was launching this whole enterprise, which I thought was all intended to get me an, an agent and a publisher so I could write a book that people would actually read, I said to friends and family, and maybe you heard me say it to you on this vlog, I don't remember, um, that one of my goals was to earn a seat at the table for the international conversation around obesity and weight loss and lifestyle and how to help people actually get healthy sustainably when they carry excess weight and aren't eating right. And they know it <laughs> and they can't change it. I wanted a seat at that table because I knew that um, 
The people in power weren't thinking about it the right way. The people who were publishing papers weren't thinking about it the right way because most of them aren't hogtied with the problem itself. Why? Because addiction is such a beast that when you do have that problem, you don't go to medical school or if you do, you don't do very well or whatever, right? Like it's not, or whatever. I, I'm one of the rare, you know, there's sort of a Venn diagram, right? Of like people who have the worst form of food addiction and are obese because of it and blah, blah, blah. And people who have the kinds of academic credentials and medical credentials that, you know, land them in positions of power, sort of deciding this sort of stuff, right? Anyway, I wanted a seat at the table to help people because I was looking around going, sustainable weight loss is possible, but not the way most people are taught to do it, right? It's got nothing to do with calories in, calories out, eat less, exercise more. That's not the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue for most people is addiction. And even though they know what to eat, to eat better, they can't do it. They're not the authors of their own destiny. This week, I think I earned a seat at the table. Let me tell you a story. This is actually mostly the story of Ocean Robbins. Ocean Robbins is a really good friend of mine. You might know of him because I talk about him all the time. Um, he wasn't a friend of mine before this Bright Line Eating thing started, but once I got the Bright Line Eating ball rolling, um, a bunch of people who knew us both tried to put us together and we ended up talking and we ended up becoming really good friends. So Ocean Robbins is the co-founder with his dad, John Robbins, of the Food Revolution Network. John Robbins of the Baskin Robbins family, uh, his story is amazing, right? He left Baskin Robbins, didn't take a cent of his um, family fortune that was rightfully his, said, no thanks, dad. Um, I don't I don't really want to live off a bunch of ice cream made money. And um, he ended up basically being a leader in the movement to educate people about healthy food and how our society is not, <laughs> um, by and large, a society of people who eat healthy food. And um, so he had a son named Ocean and, and Ocean and John Robbins later founded, co-founded the Food Revolution Network. And every year they have a summit where they invite amazing speakers to um, help educate people for fun and for free about food, healthy, sustainable, ethical, just, delicious food for all. And part of their mission is, um, it, so it's advocacy and it's education. They want to change food policy. And that makes sense because um, food policy is horrible, to be honest. Um, you know, in, in the United States government, and I know that this is a bigger issue than in the United States. This is a global issue. Um, but I know more about the United States in, in these regards than, um, than other countries. So you know, in the, the United States government since like the early 70s has been heavily subsidizing um, crops like wheat and corn and soy that are genetically modified, la laden, just loaded with pesticides like cancer causing dangerous pesticides, right? Glyphosate and stuff like that. Um, and the, the the U.S. government pays for these crops to be made. They ma mainly get fed to um, chickens and cows and so forth to make all this, you know, animal food, right? And they don't subsidize the growing of plant foods like carrots and strawberries, foods that people would actually eat. I mean, like I get that wheat and corn and soy are all plant foods, um, but by and large, the versions that are grown actually aren't edible. I don't know if you know that. Like when we grow corn in the United States, that corn's not corn on the cob. You actually can't even eat it. It's an industrial product. It goes straight to the factory. Anyway, so the Food Revolution Network wants to change policy. So Ocean Robbins, dear friend of mine, about three years ago, I didn't even know this. I knew him then. He didn't tell me this. We don't talk that often. We're both busy running our, you know, organizations, movements. Anyway, Ocean, three years ago, I found this out on the, on the phone this morning. I called him this morning. I said, Ocean, tell me the history of this. When did this all start? Who started it? He's like, yeah, I did. <laughs> I was like, did you? Tell me the story. He said, about three years ago, I started to ask and wonder, why aren't doctors taught nutrition in medical schools? And could we do something about that? 
You know that, right? Doctors aren't taught nutrition in med school. Doesn't everybody know that now? Like it's the laughing stock, right? It's a joke. Doctors aren't taught nutrition in med school because we all know that the diseases that most people are suffering the most from aren't polio and you know measles anymore. They're um, cardiovascular disease, dementia, including Alzheimer's, diabetes, stroke, cancer. These are the diseases that most people are suffering from, dying from too young and in pain, 63% of people will die too young and in pain from diseases caused by lifestyle, the foods that they are and aren't eating and all the lifestyle choices surrounding that. And doctors aren't taught that in med school. By and large, they're taught how to prescribe drugs to, to mitigate symptoms and drugs that cause other symptoms. They're taught surgery. And I'm not anymore someone who will completely throw Western medicine under the bus because I have um, micropremie twins. They're now 11 and a half, but they were less than a pound and a half each at birth. If you know, if you think in grams, 610 and 670 grams each. Uh, and Western medicine saved their life. So I know Western medicine is good for a lot of stuff. But um, a Western medicine doctor is the last person that I would trust personally if I were diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, with dementia, with diabetes, with stroke. I missed one. You get the idea, right? And a lot of us feel that way. A lot of us are spending money out of pocket to go see doctors um, that have other kinds of letters after their name, right? That the medical credential doesn't mean that much to us when we're diagnosed with something that we know has something to do with lifestyle, like food, movement, exercise, sleep. Um, a lot of us get told by our Western medical doctor one thing, and then we're like, all right, well, thanks for the prescription. <laughs> I'll go do some research on that because I don't know that I need these pills for sure. And I don't know that I want the symptoms caused by these pills. So thanks for the prescription and the 15 minutes you just spent with me. And just saying, there are a lot of doctors with really, really good hearts and they're mostly hogtied by this same system. But anyway, let me get back to the point. Doctors are not taught nutrition in medical school. So three years ago, Ocean Robbins is wondering, how come? Seriously right? In the 20 teens, right? Long past the, the millennium, that passed now a couple decades ago. How come doctors still aren't taught nutrition in medical school? So what did he do? Free thinking uh, guy that he is. He starts calling the doctors that he knows. How come you weren't taught nutrition in medical school? Why do you think that was? And, you know, a lot of them thought things like, well, it's, you know, um, that big pharma runs things, right? And it's the drug companies that must have something to do with it, or um, they had all kinds of hypotheses, right? But then through his questioning, Ocean Robbins got on the phone with David Katz, um, who's in the medical profession himself, super w smart guy. I haven't met you yet, David Katz. I don't know if you'll end up watching this video, but I can't wait to meet you. I hugely respect your work. So he's on the phone with David Katz and David Katz says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the real reason is that um, they're not tested on nutrition on the board exam, right? Um, and David Katz is um, in the business of helping to educate the next generation of doctors, right? So um, he's like, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of teaching to the test going on. And the real issue is that there's no test questions on the board exam on nutrition or lifestyle. And Ocean went, no, no, no test questions on the board exam. So we started doing some research on how doctors get certified. Turns out there's 177 med schools in the United States and many, many more overseas, of course, you know, in other countries. I'm sorry, I'm going to be um, talking a lot from a U.S. centric perspective, but I am going to talk a little bit about um, other countries as well. This is a global issue. In the United States, though, there are 177 medical schools. I don't know how many there are worldwide. And um, the National Board of Medical Examiners has a monopoly on the exam questions. 
and every med school is vying with all the other med schools for incoming students and in their glossy brochure they publish of course the percentage of their med school trainees who pass their board certification exams and go on to prosper and go on to residency right that's an important statistic right now i'm an academician by training i started teaching college courses in 1999 and i spent 16 years of my professional life teaching at colleges and universities at the university of rochester the university of new south wales in sydney australia hobart and william smith college a very sweet um, selective liberal arts college in upstate new york um, again at the University of Rochester and at Monroe Community College. So I spent 16 years of my life developing college courses and teaching college courses. I know a lot about how, how academia works. And I know a lot about what it's like to teach to a test because at one of those schools, um, we had a Psych 101 standardized test bank and the psych department hogtied us, like tied our hands behind our back and said, if you wanna teach Psych 101, you have to use our test bank of questions period. And I was a professor there. And I got to tell you, I, I taught to that test a lot. Um, there was very little that I brought into that course that wasn't on that test. Um, because I wanted my students, you know, that's what my students would be tested on, right? And I wanted my students to do well, and I didn't want them to feel frustrated. And I wanted to look successful as a professor, right? So David Katz tells Ocean Robbins, Doctors are teaching to the test. The the um, people who teach doctors, right? The um, the academics, the professors in medical school, they're teaching to the test. And there are currently zero questions on nutrition and lifestyle available in that test bank. And Ocean goes, really? And then he starts thinking, I wonder what it would take to get there to be questions in that test bank. So his first effort is to get a petition signed from the heads of medical schools, like deans and higher ups, like really influential people saying, we would like to see at least 5% of those questions in that test bank beyond nutrition. 5%. National Board of Medical Examiners goes, yeah, we'll think about it. <laughs> Ocean's like, huh. That's not the answer we wanted. And then through more conversations, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine get pulled into this and they start having discussions with the National Board of Medical Examiners and they say, look, if you pay for the writing of a bunch of test bank questions, we're not gonna do it. But if you get those test bank questions written according to our specifications. And then 75% of colleges, medical schools start to use them. We will put them on our required list of test bank questions that every doctor must pass, you know, in order to become a certified doctor, right? The, the, the licensing exam, the board, certification licensing exam for a doctor coming out of med school to get certified. Um, so they're like, all right, so now we have, to, we have to get a bunch of test questions written according to National Board of Medical Examiners standards. Costs about $250 per question to get an expert to write a question, to get it approved. There's a long process of that, right? Um, but they're like, okay, so let's say we had a thousand questions written there are currently 10,000 questions in that entire test bank of the National Board of Medical Examiners, 10,000 questions. So they're like, what if we had 1,000 questions written and like a good chunk of them were on nutrition, the rest were on lifestyle. And then we started providing the questions for free to med schools. Med schools would love this, partially because they're embarrassed that they don't teach nutrition. At this point, think about who's going to med school right now. They've graduated from college, okay? So they're 22, 23, 24 years old. They've applied to med school. Maybe they're a little older, maybe they took some time off in there, but that's about how old they are. Do you think those students don't know that what you eat is important and that prescribing a drug and, or doing a surgery isn't the be all and end all of medicine? They know that. Do you think they're cool with the fact that their medical education will include zero 
semesters on lifestyle and nutrition? No, they're gonna think that's dumb. So the med schools that first start to adopt semesters of education around nutrition and lifestyle are going to be at the cutting edge, according to the students, right? And I was in academia for long enough to know that student enrollment drives a lot. Like where are the students choosing to go to school? And if um, colleges are not marketing themselves well and not perceived as on the cutting edge, according to students, they're gonna have problems because it's student enrollment that drives, you know, colleges are businesses at the end of the day, they are. They just are, even public colleges, they're businesses. Okay, back to the point. About six months ago, the um, fundraising effort for this test bank of questions started in earnest. And at this point, Ocean Robbins and the Food Revolution Network and John Robbins were really involved. So was Susan Benegas, the executive director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And at this point, Stefan Herzog got pulled in. He's the executive director of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Okay, I know this is alphabet soup. Stay with me here. This is super important. Do not go anywhere. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine educates. The American Board of Lifestyle Medicine certifies. Lifestyle medicine is the specialty that involves what you eat and how you live your life and how that impacts your health, the mitigation, treatment, reversal, prevention of disease, and everything medically related. It is lifestyle medicine. Yes, there's a functional medicine specialty. They're very into prescribing pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, sorry, nutraceuticals and supplements. Functional medicine is a good thing. I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying that if you got scurvy and you went to a Western medicine doctor, a functional medicine doctor, and a lifestyle medicine doctor, and you had scurvy, the lifestyle medicine doctor would tell you, you need to eat a lot more apples or oranges, probably squeeze lemon water in your water and stat. You need to do that quick. The functional medicine doctor would give you probably some vitamin C pills to take or maybe vitamin C gummies to eat. And the Western medicine doctor would look at it, try to cut it out, maybe lop off the, I don't know what happens to you when you have scurvy, um, but they would prescribe some kind of pill that was not vitamin C because uh, there is no pharmaceutical company I know of um, that manufactures vitamin C. That's a rough estimate and it's a joke, but that basically tells you about the division of lifestyle medicine, functional medicine, and Western medicine in general. There's a preventive medicine specialty as well. They're not involved in um, lifestyle diseases. They're involved in preventing communicable diseases uh, like polio and measles, mumps, and rubella, and they're really interested in vaccinations and so forth. So preventive medicine is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about lifestyle medicine. Okay, back to the point, you with me? It's about to get exciting. About three weeks ago, I got a text message from Motion Robin saying, hey dear, how you doing? I miss you, would love to catch up. And I also wanna ask for your help with something. So let me know when you can talk. I think you'll be excited about it. And because he's Ocean Robbins and I adore that guy, we hopped on the phone really fast. He said, I have a project I want your help with. He explained all this to me. It sounded like alphabet soup, but it also sounded really exciting. And at the end of that conversation, I said, wait a second. Are you telling me that we're now poised at a moment in history where if we can get the money raised for a thousand questions to be written, we can get those questions for free. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is going to offer this test bank of questions to every medical school in the country. And those med schools can adopt them immediately if they want to and start teaching nutrition and lifestyle medicine in their college curricula. And that they haven't been teaching nutrition all this time because they just haven't had access to any test bank questions. And if they started teaching nutrition, they'd be, they'd be 
making it so that their students are less likely to pass their board exams, that it's literally just a matter of having test bank questions available and then med schools can start to teach nutrition if they want to? He said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I said, wait a second, the national, what's it, what's the name of it now? The um, National Board of Medical Examiners will be forced to adopt these questions on their obligatory test bank once 75% of med schools in the United States are using that test bank of questions? He said, yeah, that's right. I said, how much money do you need? He said, well, it's $250,000 for 10,000, for 1,000 questions, $250 a question, $250,000. We've only been able to raise $48,000 so far. I said, you're looking for $202,000. He said, yeah, basically. I said, you want me to ask my Brightline Eden community to help you raise $202,000 to change the face of medicine forever? He said, yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. He said, Susan, your community is more galvanized, more committed, more educated, more aware, more passionate than any community I've ever seen on, on planet Earth. Like when you put out a weekly vlog, like mountains get moved. Would you put out a vlog on this? I was like, um, let me think about it. Yeah, <laughs> I will, I will. And I said, but wait a second, Ocean. I mean, I will anyway, sweetheart, but wait a second. How do we know that these questions are gonna ask the right stuff? Is it just gonna be all about like, I mean, cause sorry, but I know that the Food Revolution Network is very heavily about not eating animals and eating more plants. And I said, I love that, that's important. And I agree, people need to be eating way more vegetables. You know, you and I are on the same page about that. But what about sugar? What about flour? What about processed food? What about addiction? What about the susceptibility scale that not every brain is equally susceptible to food addiction? And that explains a lot of the um, disconnect that you see out there, right? The people in power by and large don't have very susceptible brains because they haven't been hogtied with a brain that's like a special needs child up there, right? I said, what about that? Like, he said, okay, well, hold on, girl. He said, um, I need to put you in touch with the people who are coordinating this effort. I said, please do. <laughs> a couple days later, I was on a Zoom video interview with Susan Benegas, the executive director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. This was like, I, I wish I knew exactly. On one of those days that I had one of those really profound spiritual experiences, I'll look it up in my five-year journal, whether it was like the day that I got that feeling from whatever the great mystery is that um, Bright Line Eating was gonna be bigger than I even imagined. Anyway, Susan Benegas is amazing. Love that woman. <sighs> Learned so much from her. And she said, everything you're saying, Susan, to me, everything you're saying, Susan, makes so much sense around addiction. And um, I showed her some of our data and I said, here's the thing. The reason that we have better long-term outcomes than any weight loss program on planet Earth is that I come from a background of addiction and recovery. I come from a background where I'm thinking deeply about the question of, you know, this is great what you're telling me to do to change my life right now, but how do we make sure that people are actually still doing it in a year, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years? I told her, I have 25 years clean and sober, which means that somehow I've managed to not go back to the drink or the drug in 25 years. We're talking longevity. We're talking about permanent lifestyle change. And I said, are you teaching your people anything about the principles of traction and compliance and execution over the long term? And she said, no, we're not. She said, let me introduce you to Stefan Herzog. He is the executive director of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Okay, the college educates, the board certifies. So now we're talking about the organization that develops and maintains the test banks and the examinations for lifestyle medicine cert certification. Over the last 
48 hours, 72 hours. I've spent about four hours talking with this guy. Love this guy. Smart, soulful, fun, healthy <laughs> guy. We've both been walking like fiends up and down hills as we talk. We're like, yep, still outside walking, um, practicing what we preach. So um, I told him I would try to help raise this money. But I also told him I really care about what goes into these questions because it, it's got to be, you got to be also really beating the drum of like processed food, processed food. It's like 58% of Americans calories right now are coming from highly processed foods. They're not even foods. They're industrial manufactured products. They happen to be edible. That's the only difference that they have from a couch or a piece of furniture or a a mug like they're industrial manufactured products they're not food and research shows that when you eat them you want to eat more and you get fatter like right away he said i hear you susan i showed him some of our data too we were zooming for like a, a video conference for some of this and i put some of our bright line eating data up on the screen and he was like whoa so today I was on the phone with him to run by what I'm going to say on this vlog. And um, he said, you know, I've already talked to Wayne Dysinger. He is the chairman of the board of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And just saying, he's also the chairman of the board of the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. So exciting news is that lifestyle medicine is an international movement. And the certification, the certifying body the Board of Lifestyle Medicine has the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And my understanding is they share the same test bank and the same certification criteria. Their certifying criteria spread around the world. Those um, statements about what lifestyle medicine is spread around the world. Stefan and I looked at them together on the website and I talked about how there was a bunch missing. I said, if, if you don't include information in here that not every brain is equally susceptible to addiction, and for about two thirds of the population, either, either to an extreme degree or a moderate degree, those brains are going to be brains that are gonna be uh, really resistant to change based on information alone. That the right model is not education for those people. The right model is recovery from addiction. That you're actually, these aren't just like, um, oh, bad habits based on lack of knowledge. Where if you just give someone a class or help them understand, and we were joking, he's like, yeah, that makes sense. We were joking over the phone. I was like, it's not like people are unaware that blueberries are healthier than donuts. Like everybody knows that. And we were laughing. It's true, right? What we have worldwide is not an information deficit. What we have is an epidemic of food addiction. I said, if you don't have information in these certification competencies about the susceptibility scale, the food addiction susceptibility scale, so that doctors First thing, lifestyle medicine doctors, first thing, and in the future, all doctors can be asking, how susceptible is your brain to addiction? What are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with bad habits or are we dealing with addictions? Because the prescription after that depends on the answer to that question. And if we're not educating doctors that food addiction is real, that there is powerful neuroscientific evidence that is the nail in the coffin of that fact. And all you gotta do is look around at all the people who can't change their eating and are still overweight and unhealthy and facing blindness and leg amputation and so forth. And they're still saying, oh, I couldn't not eat sugar. All you gotta do is look at that fact and the definition of addiction is continued use of a substance or behavior despite facing deleterious consequences to know that food addiction is real. This is not complicated stuff, guys. 
Food addiction is real. We need to teach them about the susceptibility scale. We need to teach them that food addiction is real. And then we need to be talking about what do you do if you're addicted, that bright lines are gonna matter. Back up, Susan Benegas was like, um, whoa, how would you feel about bright line eating? You know, we, we've never seen a program that has data like this. Like we should talk. We have a research arm of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I want to put you in touch with those people. Stefan Herzog was like, yeah, I just talked to Wayne Dysinger, who by the way was like, oh yeah, I know about Brightline Eating. Wayne, I haven't met you yet, but I look forward to meeting you. And I'm curious. I tried to call you this morning. I did call you. I left a message, but um, I'm curious how you know about Brightline Eating. That's exciting. Wayne Dysinger is the chairman of the board of both the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, he practices apparently in somewhere in, somewhere in Southern California, Riverside, I believe. All right, I need, to, I need to cut to the chase here. Stand with me. We get to do this together. We get to raise $200,000, $202,000. It's actually not that much money. David and I have been, um, you might be like, well, to you, Susan, that's a lot of money to me. I know, I know. Settle down, Beavis. Um, so money is a weird thing, right? Uh, I promise you there are people on Wall Street for whom $200,000 is not a lot of money, right? And the fact that one of those rich people suckers, right? Some hedge fund manager who's annoyed about how he got treated uh, by his Western medicine doctor when he got diagnosed with diabetes. And the doctor's appointment was all about the glucose tabs he could take if he started to feel faint and the insulin shots that he now had to take every time his glucose went too high. And he's sitting there thinking, aren't you going to tell me to eat differently? Like, I know that's part of the problem, doctor. And it never came up in the appointment. All it would take is one hedge fund manager in New York City who had a bee in his bonnet about that particular particular doctor's appointment to hear this vlog and, and or to hear about this opportunity, the situation. And I promise you, he would pull out a check, a checkbook and write a check for $202,000. Like there are people on this earth for whom $202,000 is not a lot of money. Why they haven't heard about this opportunity, I don't know. That's not my problem. But um, I am telling you right now, right now, that if we can together raise $202,000, by December 31st, that is the goal. You hear me? $202,000 by December 31st, 2019. Starting January 31st, January 1st, the next day, those test bank questions will be written. Stefan Herzog has a three month goal for those test bank questions to be written. Then one month for the questions to be tested according to National Board of Medical Examiners standards. They've got their standards, great. One month for testing. Make sure there's no double negatives in the questions. Make sure there's no double barreled questions, blah, blah, blah. Good questions. These are multiple choice questions. And then there's going to be a marketing campaign to all the med schools, probably in the United States and probably internationally as well. The test, the test question writers, by the way, are 12 people, five in nutrition, seven in other lifestyle factors, and oh, by the way, it's now 13 because Susan Pierce Thompson is one of them. I'm not gonna take a dime for my questions. We still need to raise $202,000 though, because I believe the way it's gonna work is that the number of questions that I'm gonna write is just gonna be added to the thousand. 1,000 was an arbitrary number. We'd, we'd rather have more questions. So I said, yeah, let's just add more questions to the bank so that we can help dilute the 10,000 questions in the National Board of Medical Examiners te test bank, which are almost exclusively about the use of pharmaceuticals and surgery to basically prescribe pills and lop off things. Um, let's dilute those questions with more lifestyle and nutrition-based questions. So I will write questions for free. We still need enough money to pay for 1,000 questions to be written and they'll be ready and starting to be in medical school's hands by July, 2020. Can you believe that we have this opportunity? Right before I rolled camera on this vlog, well, I was so excited that I ran up my front stairs and rolled my left ankle, so I'm kind of standing here on one ankle, but after that, 
I opened up my laptop after talking to David. And I donated $20,000 from me and him. Now I know some of you out there think I'm really rich, but um, actually that was money that we were gonna use to try to pay down some of our mortgage debt at the end of this year. I'm not saying I'm hard off financially, I'm just saying I don't drive a car that I own, my kids don't have college funds, and we still live in a house that we don't own, the bank owns. Um, so, you know, I'm not whining, I'm just saying we were gonna try to pay down some of our mortgage debt and we're foregoing um, some of those goals because we think this is more important. So I guess that means we need $182,000. Brightline Eating, if you're a Brightline Eating employee and you're watching this, Brightline Eating is matching all of your donations. If you're a Brightline Eating employee, I know you already got the email about that, but um, we are. So just so you know, whoever's watching out there, we're standing by like that donation, just saying that David and I made, that's uh, not as much as we've ever donated to any charitable cause ever, not twice as much, not three times as much. It's more than four times as much as we've ever donated to any charitable cause. We have never believed in something so strongly. And by writing questions, I'm donating tens of thousands of dollars more because I'll just write questions for free. So I'm donating my time as well. Is it unacceptable to you that doctors are not taught nutrition in medical schools? Stand with me. Is it ridiculous to you? Ridiculous to you that processed foods are served as meals in hospitals when people are recovering from illness? Stand with me. Is it a crime from your perspective that the third leading cause of death is treatment by doctors and hospitals? Stand with me. Let's do this. I don't know why we get to be so lucky, except that I think it was some Greek philosopher Seneca a long, long time ago that said that luck is when, what is it, how does it go? Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And then I think it was Thomas Edison who says opportunity, <laughs> most people miss opportunity because it shows up in overalls and looks like work. Well, this isn't that much work actually. All you gotta do is click below and donate. Let me tell you again what the goals are. $202,000 by December 31st. I just put in 20 grand, so $182,000 more by December 31st. I want this done, let's do this before the close of this decade. It's just r nice round numbers, right? Like, why not? Why not have the, all of the test bank questions being written starting January 1st, 2020? Wouldn't that be clean and pretty? By July 1st, these questions will be available to medical schools. And again, just the way the flow is gonna work, just, so, just to make sure you understand me, the first step is that medical schools will get free access to these questions. Why free access? Because we're paying to have them written and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is gonna hand them to medical schools for free, which will make them attractive questions because the National Board of Medical Examiners pay, makes, the, makes those colleges and universities pay through the teeth for access to their test bank. These questions will be free to colleges and universities, med schools. And the minute they have access to a test bank of questions, Med schools will then have the option, the opportunity to start offering semesters of lifestyle and nutrition in their college programs. Now, there are four colleges, uh, medical schools right now in the United States that offer lifestyle medicine as a residency, a specialty. My guess is that if we take action right now, by the fall of 2020, those four Medical schools will be offering several full semesters of lifestyle and nutrition. And then the rest of the med schools will have free access to a test bank of questions. And if they have faculty on staff who could teach courses in nutrition and lifestyle, those classes will start to be designed and taught in due time. And as soon as 75% of the medical schools in the country, I think it's gonna happen fast. I think medical schools are embarrassed. 
that they don't offer nutrition. And I think the students coming in are gonna want it. And they're gonna be comparison shopping and they're gonna go preferentially to the med schools who will educate them in the way they wanna be educated as doctors, the way they wanna practice medicine. I think it's gonna spread like wildfire. And as soon as 75% of medical schools are using some of these questions, it will become mandatory that these questions be on the board certification exam for all doctors. And again, this is an international effort. These questions will go into the test bank for the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. They will be available to any med school around the world that wants to use them and offer them and therefore teach nutrition and lifestyle. And all we got to do is raise $202,000, $182,000. Are you standing with me? Are you excited? Is your mind blown? You get to lie on your deathbed and think, I really made a difference. We get to lie on our deathbed and think, I really made a difference. I care also if you don't have much money to donate. I want you to donate a little bit anyway. David and I donated what felt like a pinch. Like for us, that took our breath away that we were gonna donate that much money. I could see his eyes bug out and mine did too when I suggested it. I suggested a number that felt like a radical stretch. Every budget is different, money is a weird thing. I want enough people to donate that we feel proud together as a Bright Line Eating community. My initial goal for number of people is 2020. <laughs> Cause I like numbers, 2020. Can we get 2,020 people please? Right now to click below and donate? We can do that, right? I think I wanna get 5,000 people. Why not? What I really want is for every soul that feels the call to take action on it. And I, of course, have no way of gamifying that or knowing at all what number that might be. Your, if you live in the United States, your donation is fully tax deductible. It's going to the Ameri American College of Lifestyle Medicine. They are housing this fundraising effort. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a 501c3 organization. It is fully tax deductible. So if you itemize your tax donations and you live in the United States, just saying Uncle Sam is gonna pay for a fair percentage of your donation. And I think that's fitting because Uncle Sam's been paying for the subsidization of crappy food for a long, 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 long time. So they should pay fair, their fair share and they will. Out of the tax dollars, they will not receive from you because you're making this donation. <laughs> If you're watching this vlog anywhere other than at brightlineeating.com, let's say you're watching it on Facebook or on YouTube, there might not be a donation button down below. Here's what you do about that. Go to brightlineeating.com. B-R-I-G-H-T-L-I-N-E-E-A-T-I-N-G, brightlineeating.com. Click on blog. And then look for this blog. It's, it's Let's Make History Together. If it's a long time from now, just look at the search box, Let's Make History Together, and click to donate. Whatever you can donate matters. There is a spiritual principle of universal participation. It's like the idea that if you're sitting in a room and everyone is in, the sum is greater than its parts, right? Life is not additive. The math doesn't work quite like that. Ask the astrophysicist, right? The people who know the most math <laughs> aren't that impressed by addition. It's not actually the, the um, you know, it's not the calculation that matters most. When everyone's in, exponentially explosive things happen. So if everyone who feels moved or touched to make history clicks, and donates something. The impact of our actions together will be exponentially explosive. And before I sign off, I have one more request. If you know someone of means, 
someone who's rich, let's just call it out. If you know someone who's actually really rich, would you forward this vlog to them? Someone who at the end of this year, at the end of 2019 might be thinking, oh, I had a good year, my tax liability is terrible. What am I gonna do to not give Uncle Sam so much of that money? And if you think they might be someone who understands how absurd it is, how criminal it is, how many people are being hurt by the fact that doctors are not taught nutrition in medical schools, that lifestyle in general, how you sleep, whether you move, whether you have friends and feel connected, the food that you are or aren't putting in your mouth, that doctors are not taught anything about that in medical school and that big pharma as of right now has had the say over what goes into those test bank questions and then doctors are teaching to that test if you think they might be at all incensed by that and at all proud to change history with us would you forward them this vlog because i know my husband used to do valuation for hedge fund experts hedge funds in, in New York City worth billions of dollars. I know that there are people out there who would open a checkbook and write a check to solve this problem. Would you forward them this vlog? I don't know that many people like that. <laughs> I really don't. Would you forward them this vlog? Let's make sure it ends up in the hands that it needs to end up in, shall we? I will keep you posted. And Brightline Eating, we have earned a seat at the table for the international discussion on obesity and weight loss and lifestyle and nutrition and food and the discussion about what should be done about the fact that 70% of people in the Western world are overweight or obese. Obesity is now a bigger problem in developing nations than malnutrition. And that 63% of people are dying too young and in pain from the food they're putting in their mouth that's not really food. We have earned a seat at that table. Stand with me right now and let's raise this money before the end of 2019. <sighs> We are about to make history. Click below. I love you. That was the weekly vlog, and I'll see you next week.